All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. And as part of the Rankin Technical College AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies course, I've been creating a series of video presentations that are based on the Mozilla Developer Network Learn Web Development Series. I'm talking server-side website programming and we're in server-side web frameworks. As mentioned here, the previous article showed what the communication between web clients and servers look like, the nature of HTTP requests and responses, what a server-side web app needs to do to respond, etc. It says now it's time to explore how web frameworks can simplify these tasks and give you an idea of how to, you choose a framework for your first application. The following sections illustrate some points using code fragments. It says don't be concerned if it doesn't make sense because they'll be going over them later. And again, one, one last time to remind you, I will be going over the information on Node.js. I will not be going over the information on Django. So if they give any Django-specific examples, I'm just going to skip them. All right. So server-side frameworks, also known as web application frameworks, are software frameworks that make it easier to write, maintain, and scale web apps. They provide tools and libraries to simplify common web development tasks, including routing, URLs to the appropriate handlers, interacting with databases, supporting sessions and user authorization, formatting output, and improving security, which is the idea that we'll talk about in the, the next video against web attacks. So what can a framework do for you? Guess what? Kind of just answered that. And they, they kind of sit, you know, summarize it here to say they provide the tools and libraries to simplify common web development operations. You don't have to use one, but one is strongly advised. Probably what we'll end up doing when we get into this in the AWD 1111 class is we'll first write an application that doesn't use a framework. And to, to, to just show you how much harder it is to, you know, write one that doesn't have a framework. All right. As we saw in the last article, web servers and browsers communicate using the HTTP protocol. Servers wait for HTTP, and, and really, when they're saying HTTP, it's HTTP or HTTPS. Requests from the browser and return information in the response. Web frameworks allow you to write a simplified syntax that will generate server-side code to work with these requests and responses, meaning that you'll have an easier job because some of it will be, for lack of better words, kind of being done for you. So it says the example below works in Django. I'm not going to run through it. All right. So most sites provide a number of different resources accessible through distinct URLs. Handling these is one function that would be hard to maintain. In other words, if you've got a, a site that's going to go to different pages, based on the information you provide that's the routing type of mechanism that they're talking about and again if you've got something that you know i've mentioned this before that for example is performing crud operations c-r-u-d for create read update and delete you'd have four different pages one that would handle creating things or inserting things one that would handle reading things and you might have several for reading things one might provide everything Another one might let you uh, limit to whatever it is, you, you know, have some kind of a feature in there where you can search for things. You'd have a different page that would come up to allow you to update a certain record or whatever, and another one to allow you to delete a record. All right. As it says, this approach has benefits in terms of maintenance because you can change the URL used to deliver a feature without having to use the under change the underlying code. It's the whole idea of interface versus implementation. The interface is what the user sees. The implementation is what happens under the hood for them to get there. I've used this example several times. If not in this series, I've used it in other ones. If I bring up the calculator and I type in 367 and I hit the X2 here. No, I don't want that. Uh, let me try that again. If I do the 367 and I click this, that's the square root, right? I have no idea internally how that happened. My interface is the calculator. I have to input two things, the number 
and I have to input the square root symbol. My output is what's shown on the screen right here. But if somebody tomorrow figured out a better, faster way to give me the square root, and I did not have to, I did not have to change the interface at all, I that's great, that's great, it'd be fine. Different frameworks use different mechanisms for the mapping that takes place. All right, and I'm sorry if it turns out that virtually all of the examples that they have in here are Django examples that'll make this a lot go a lot quicker, I guess. Data can be encoded in an HTM, HTTP request in a number of ways. A GET request to get files or data from a server is required in URL parameters or within the URL structure. A POST to update will instead include the update information as post data. We already talked about putting something in a query string versus kind of hiding it, so to speak, inside of a, head, of a header. The HTTP request may also include information about the current session or a user in a client side cookie. All right. Web frameworks provide programming language appropriate mechanisms to access this information. All right. Websites use databases to store both the information, both to be shared with users and about users. Frameworks often provide a database layer that abstracts the stuff I mentioned to you before, the read, write, query, et cetera, types of operations. Typically, this abstraction, as it says, is referred to as an ORM or an object relational manager. Doing it this way, as the author mentions here, has two different benefits. First, you can replace the underlying database without needing to change the code that uses it. Second, basic validation of data can be implemented within the framework, which means it's less code that you have to write. Again, they give another Django example here that I'm not going to go through. All right. Rendering data here. As mentioned, web frameworks often provide templating systems that allow you to structure the output. All right, typically, not always, but typically this will be written back as JSON. It can also be written back as XML. Now it says many other templating systems use a similar syntax. All right, JavaScript can use things like handlebars, mustache, and literally what those are, as it says, they're different templating systems. All right. How to select a web framework? Well, the decision has been made for you at Rankin Technical College. All right. And what, what I see happening over time, right now at Rankin Technical College, we have four different courses that we offer as part of the AWD or Application and Web Design um, program. And to show them to you very quickly, because I don't want to waste my time or yours. Here they are. In the first semester, students take the class that this um, series, basically most of it up to this point, has been gauged for, and that's AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies. In their second semester, student takes, students take Programming Fundamentals with C Sharp. In their third semester, students take the other class that we've talked about in here, and that being Database-Driven Web Development. And then finally, in the fourth semester, students take Mobile Application Development. Well, what could happen over time, I'm not saying it will, but what could happen over time is this class might become almost solely a class in HTML, CSS, maybe some bootstrap, and a quick intro to JavaScript. This class may or may not stay as it is. This class is going to be all JavaScript, J no JS, etc. And this class could potentially, I'm not saying it ever will, but it could potentially become a class in building mobile apps using JavaScript. All right. So you start to see, hopefully, 
what you start to see is just how I'm trying to think of the right word I, elastic came to mind but that's not the word that I'm looking for but how you can use these web frameworks to do a lot of different things the web framework that you choose some of the factors how easy is it to learn okay productivity as it says it's a measure of how quickly you can create new features once you're familiar with the framework so once you know it how fast can you make it do what you want it to do performance it says usually speed is not the biggest factor all right the perceived speed benefits of you know, different languages may be offset by cost of learning and maintenance. Well, one of the advantages of using Node.js is students learn JavaScript in their first semester, and they can use the same language in yet another semester. What kind of caching support does it provide? How scalable is it? Again, we'll talk about this in the next video, but how secure is it? says if you're an absolute beginner at programming you'll probably choose your framework based on ease of learning says let's go to the main websites for django and express says you can navigate them to find out how good they are well again we will be going to the express one and we will be do doing some work on that all right looks very simple but there's a lot of stuff to this all right, it says now let's go on and discuss a few specific server side web frameworks. The ones shown below represent a few of the popular at the time of this writing. Again, not my idea here, not my intention to go over Django or Flask. But let's talk about this one here. Express, as it says, is a fast, unopinionated, flexible, and minimalist web framework for Node.js. Well, look. Where do you think they got that from? As it says, it provides a robust set of features for web and mobile applications and delivers useful HTTP utility methods and something referred to as middleware. Express is extremely popular, popular rather, partially because it eases the migration of client-side JavaScript so if, if somebody has been a client-side JavaScript programmer, they're going to be using the same language, JavaScript, but on the server side. All right, as it says, it's also resource efficient. Because Express is a minimalist web framework, it does not incorporate every component that you might want to use. Some, you know, a lot of times, it, I mean, it provides thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of components but a lot of times you've got to load them in through independent libraries. All right. Deno, as it says, is a simple, modern, and secure JavaScript TypeScript. It's interesting because Deno, to my knowledge, was created by the, by the same person, Ryan Dahl, I think it is, who created Node.js. It says there it aims to fill in some of the loopholes in Node by providing a mechanism that maintains better security. We may eventually do some work with Deno here. Now, the AWD1111 class used to be a class in ASP.NET because users would go and have, in the first semester, they would learn website design. They would learn C Sharp in the second semester. In the third semester, they would use C Sharp in accordance with ASP.NET, which, as it says, is an open source web framework for building modern applications and services. All right. The current class that we run in C Sharp, which is more or less writing C Sharp applications using web forms, may change in the near future to become an ASP.NET class. So, as mentioned here, this article has shown that web frameworks make it easier to develop and maintain server-side code. It also provided a high-level overview of a few popular frameworks, of which I only talked about a few, and discussed criteria for choosing web applica a web application framework. All right. In the final article in this series, 
says they will talk about website security. So I will be back with that shortly.